All right, so welcome to today. We are going to end up doing chapter 11 today. Don't forget, you've got a test coming up soon. So you should be practicing all of your quizzes and things of that nature. So today we're gonna to talk about contracts. Now contracts are something that we have touched on throughout the course. And personally, I would have moved this chapter way earlier in the book, but uh, we can't teach everything first. So they push this back to the near the end of the book. So we're going to start on page 188, dealing with contracts. <clears throat> and I literally want to read something to you. It says a contract is a voluntary agreement or promise between legally competent parties supported by local cons uh, legal consideration to perform or not perform some legal act. Other, all right? So the reason I read it to you is because I wanted you to see that there are literally five parts to a contract. All five parts have to be in place. It has to be a voluntary agreement. All right, you cannot take someone in the back room and break their knees like in the old days to get them to agree to a contract. It has to be voluntary between both parties. It is an agreement or a promise to do something. And in the real estate world, it's an agreement to transfer or convey real estate and the buyer to convey money. So that's the agreement is to transfer or convey this property. Legally competent parties, all right? So they gotta be 18 years of age in the state of Indiana and they have to be of sufficient mental capacity to understand the outcome of the deal. So in other words, not an IU grad. That's coming from a Purdue graduate. So um, thumbs down. Huh? <laughs> so they gotta be sufficient. It doesn't say that they can't be, you know, not smart, it just has sufficient mental capacity, all right? And it has to be supported by legal consideration. Now, the one thing we're gonna talk about today in the contract is literally how this marries up, or we've talked about it before, to the wedding contract, all right? And legal consideration in real estate means what? In the marriage contract, the thing of value is love, honor, and cherish. That has value. But we sell real estate at what we call an arm's length transaction, meaning we don't know the other party. So therefore, the only thing of value to us is money. So in this particular case, legal the consideration is money. We have to exchange money in the real estate world, okay? And it has to be for a legal act. Obviously, conveying of real estate is a legal act. So if you ever used to watch The Sopranos, when they would take a contract out on somebody, that's really not a contract because that's not a legal act, all right? So those are the five parts of the contract that all five of these have to be in place. And we'll see that here in just a little bit. Um, tell you what, hold on a second. I'm going to do something. I think that may be a little better. Those lights seem to be winding me. So I don't know how it's doing for you. Now, when a contract gets written, it gets written in two forms. It's either express contract. An express contract is where both parties understand their portion of the contract. For instance, Shauna, I'll wash your car today for $20. Yes or no? Now, that's a contract. It has all five parts involved in it. The only thing in that particular contract, it happens to be oral. Indiana does recognize oral contracts, but not in real estate, all right? 
in your book, there is a term called the statute of frauds. I'm telling you now, they love this word or this term because most everybody forgets what it is. It's called the statute of frauds. The statute of frauds states that some contracts to be defendable in a court of law must be written. Real estate works under the statute of frauds. <clears throat> we cannot have an oral listing agreement. We cannot have an oral purchase agreement. We cannot have an oral deed. They must all be in writing. Occasionally, you will get someone that'll call you and go, hey, I saw your house was listed. Uh, tell your buyer we'll give him, or tell your seller I'll give him 100 grand. And you're like, nah, no. That was oral. It's not valid. You really want me to get, present that offer? Write it down, and then I'll present it because of the statute of frauds, all right? So an express contract typically is written, but could be oral, but it defines what both parties are supposed to do as their portion of the contract. Contrast that with what's called an implied contract. And implied is where one party or the other know their portion of the contract without it being expressly stated, all right? So for instance, when you guys leave class today, on your way home, you're gonna stop and have lunch at Taco Bell. Before, okay, maybe not Taco Bell. I saw the look Sarah just gave me. <laughs> okay, where do you wanna to go to eat? We can go anywhere. Before, before <laughs> I thought she turned her video off. Before you actually leave, what do you guys do? You pay, right? Why did you pay? There was nothing written on the wall. There was no form given to you that said, if we feed you, you'll pay. That is an implied contract. You know your portion. You know they gave, rendered you a service or a product. So therefore you're going to compensate them for that. All right. Used to be in the old days for us old people, we would pump gas and then go in and pay. All right, because we knew that that was, they gave us gas, we went and paid. Now you go in and pay first. And I went in and I talked to the guy one day, I'm like, hey, the pump won't turn off. He's like, well, you gotta pay first. And I literally asked him, I said, well, why is that? And I really got him battered enough to say, basically, we don't really trust people anymore. And I'm like, well, if I pay you before I pump, how do I trust you that you're gonna turn the pump on? And he went, what? I'm like, never mind, forget it. That's, that's what happens when I get bored, I, stuff like that. So that is an implied contract where one party or the other understands what they're supposed to be doing, okay? Now, that is, those are two types of contracts. There's also two styles. One of them is bilateral. Bilateral, by bi meaning two, like bicycle, means both parties have an action in this contract. All of the real estate contracts we are going to talk about are bilateral and they work under the statute of frauds. Remember one of the things I mentioned that said kills a listing it was called a mutual release i told you at that time mutual means both parties have to agree that's an example of a bilateral contract not just one of you can agree to terminate a listing it requires both parties not just one person can agree to buy the property it has to have the seller agree to sell it okay so real estate, all the contracts, you listen to what I'm saying? All of them, except one, is bilateral, all right? All of our contracts are bilateral, requires both the buyer and the seller, or in some cases, the agent and the client to interact in this client, all right, contract. 
The other style is called a unilateral contract. A unilateral contract only requires one party to have to act. The best example I can give you, are you guys familiar with the old layaway concept? You would go in and buy something and you give it to the lady behind the counter and lay away. So you put like $5 down. All right. Do you ever have to go back and buy that, uh, whatever you put away, that bicycle or shirt or TV? The answer is no, you do not. Now, you lose that money you put down, but you never have to go back and buy it. But if you do, they have to sell it to you. All right. So in that contract called layaway, only one party has to act. The other has an option to. Okay. Another good example would be, have you guys ever seen a sign like posted on a telephone pole that said, reward for information for my lost cat, call so-and-so? Do you have to call that phone number? No. But if you do and give the information, they must, in fact, pay you the reward. So those are unilateral contracts. There's only one of those in real estate. It's called the option. You guys ever heard of an option? This is literally where the word comes from. It's an option. A buyer may option to buy a farmer's land. An option is the right to do something in the future at terms we negotiate today, like layaway. I want to buy the TV next month when I get paid, but I'm going to do it under this price today. <coughs> Investors use options all the time. I want to buy this property within the next six months for a price we're going to agree upon today. And for that option, I'm going to give you what they call option consideration of $1,000. That buyer never has to go back and buy. Now, he'll lose the $1,000, but he never has to go back. If he does go back and say, hey, I want to exercise my option and buy your farm, let's close. And then he would buy the farm. Like I said, investors use this for speculation all the time. Suppose an investor hears through the grapevine that Walmart's going to buy, build in Franklin. So he goes out to a farmer and finds a bunch of acres and says, hey, look, I want the right or the option to buy your property within the next year and I'll pay you $20,000 an acre. And today I'm going to give you $1,000 for that right. Then all of a sudden, Walmart pops up and says, hey, we're going to buy some land and we're going to pay $80,000 an acre. So the investor would go and exercise his option, buy it for 20 and sell to Walmart for 80. All right. Now, the other side of that story, suppose Walmart says, hey, we were going to build in Franklin, but the economy's changed. So we're not buying now. Investor now never exercises his option, and all he is out is the one thousand dollars he gave. I have yes, a question. So, does Walmart fall under what you were talking about yesterday in regards to like big businesses, like with Home Depot renting, like well, the land no. or the building? Walmart does not do a sale lease back. Walmart owns their own property. Meyer, Walmart, Walmart and uh, what's the other big one? Um, they all own their own property. Oh, okay. Right. I didn't so know. They wouldn't fall under the sale lease back. But oh. even if they did, they would still buy it, build on it, and then sell the entire parcel to an investor and lease the entire parcel back. Right. Okay. Now, 
what you're talking about, Shauna, actually exists. And I think we're going to talk about it. It's called a land lease, where they just actually rent the land from the farmer for like 99 years. And there's reasons for that. We'll talk about it. But in this scenario, they would still buy the land so they could own it as the entire parcel with the land in the building. And then they could resell it as a sale lease back. All right. 